So um, today, since this is our first session together and we have this theme, responding with loving awareness that has emerged out of looking both at the data that you all shared with us uh, in the co-design surveys, you know, what kinds of practices you're interested in um, right now, what kind of practices you feel like you're weakest at but want to shore up, um, what you feel like you're strongest at, all the, all the questions that we asked in terms of your intentions, um, practice interests, um, uh, different questions around the polarities of practice, you know, where do you lean? Are you more sort of um, into formal practice right now or life practice? Are you more into... Are you more into um, social practice, like practicing with others? Or are you more into kind of uh, solo practice? These kind of questions give us a kind of picture. And then, of course, we're, we're living through this uh, kind of pandemic right now, right in the middle of this pandemic, uh, where every, a lot of people are self-isolating and we're, we're going through something that I, personally I've never experienced on the scale. Um, so it's, it's a huge time of cultural and societal disruption. So we're taking into account that backdrop and then what you shared and what came out of that uh, was this theme responding with loving awareness. And um, part of the reason uh, that that theme emerged is because when we looked at what you're most interested in practicing as a group, awareness practice was uh, the thing that came to the top. Uh, and then mindfulness and heartfulness, pretty close, fairly close behind that. Um, and so awareness being the most, what you're most interested in. And then in terms of what, uh, as a group, um, you all communicated you're collectively weakest at, uh, is heartfulness practice. Of course, that's not true for every individual, but just as a group, uh, and that you wanted to focus on heartfulness. So we sort of took these two most interested and weakest at, and we sort of brought them together, you know, heartful, heartfulness and awareness which you could also translate as loving awareness. Um, now this term itself, loving awareness, um, for me, it, it comes out of my engagement with um, my own teachers, Jack Cornfield and Trudy Goodman, and their close friend who recently passed away, Ram Dass. Uh, Ram Dass uses this phrase often in his teaching or used it. And, um, Jack, I saw recently talking about the phrase loving awareness, and he, he was saying that for him, this is actually his current favorite translation of the term, the Buddhist term, metta, which is often translated as loving kindness. Um, here lately, he's been translating it and using the term loving awareness. And I think this is very interesting. Um, I, I've fallen in love with, with the term and what it points to. And for, for me, it, it kind of points to this bringing together of two facets of spiritual life that sometimes can feel um, separate from each other or, or somehow as, as if they live in different places. You know, what is awareness? What is love? Oftentimes the, the, the answer to those questions, they seem to point in slightly different directions. Um, but I think for those of us who've been working with these different ways of practicing for a long time, um, and have really like gotten some lessons, you know, pounded into us. Uh, we start to see, you know, that, that the, these distinctions and separations, while true at some point, also fall apart at others. You know, as we get to get more into the fractal of awakening, you know, we start to see actually that there is a convergence point that all these different ways, while different, also converge uh, at a single point. And so loving awareness to me is a kind of integration or convergence of these two dimensions of open heartedness on the one hand, you have the capacity for the heart to be open to whatever it is to embrace and accept and include what is. And then this um, capacity of awareness, which is very similar in some ways, the capacity of awareness is to, to simply reflect whatever it is to, to know whatever it is for everything that is arising to be simply known in the light of awareness. Um, now, awareness typically, though, doesn't have the connotations of that sort of warm-hearted, open-hearted, you know, kind of quality of love. 
But what I found in practice is that love doesn't necessarily even have to have those qualities. Um, I remember I've shared this story a number of times, but to me it was such a, a huge insight with respect to the to the relationship between love and awareness. And that is, um, I was on a two month uh, no, this was a month retreat, and I was doing inquiry practice. So the whole month just working with questions. Uh, and this was a, a retreat where I was working closely with Jack uh, Cornfield and Trudy Goodman. And they were giving me questions. And the third question they gave me, which was the last one I worked with, was what is love? First one was who am I? What am I? What is love? And the first two I felt very comfortable with. You know, what, who am I? What am I? These are questions I've been asking for a long time. Um, and that felt familiar and not easy, but familiar. And then what is love? <laughs> it was like, no, like, I, I, what are you talking about? What is love? And it was interesting because when I asked the question initially was working with it, uh, I'd ask, what is love? And then all of a sudden there'd be like this flood, this flood of good feelings and this kind of rush of care and kindness and like all these sort of feelings I associated with love. Um, there'd be kind of abstract images of everything kind of being interconnected and uh, you know, for a while I was like, okay, yeah, I'm really getting this. this. This question threw me for a loop when I first heard it, but now I'm like, clearly I'm getting it. What is love? Like, this. Ah. And then uh, after a couple of days that faded, you know, that response faded. And, and every time I asked the question for a while, I was like, what is love? And I was like, ah, like an emotion, literally a, a, a upwelling of anger, disgust, frustration, confusion, doubt, like all of the things that seem, seemed opposite to love, you know, the feeling of love. And I just kept asking the question and kept having this sort of repulsive, repulsive you know, experience arise in response. And I thought I was like doing something wrong, you know, like this isn't right. That love should, you know, love should be like something I can recognize. And um, at some point I stopped, but it was so painful and so difficult. I stopped. And I was like, if I were doing noting practice, which is the technique I'd done, you know, thousands of hours of and felt like I could do, I could handle anything with that technique. Uh, if I were doing noting practice, how would I handle this? And I sort of stopped and I'm just like, well, I just allow whatever's there, feel the sensations, notice them in the body, note them. And then in the moment of kind of reflecting on that, I suddenly kind of hit me like a, you know, kind of a dawning of insight, kind of shock, like, oh, like that, that is love as well. You know, the capacity to open up and just be with sensations, to allow the revulsion, the confusion, the doubt. Like that is love. Like there's no feeling associated with the experience uh, per se. Um, but because love at the deepest, most universal level is not a feeling. If it were a feeling, it'd be a state of consciousness, something that comes and goes. Um, but this absolute love is something that, that it's like that which can embrace everything, that which can hold everything. Um, what is that? I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, and how do you respond from that place of loving awareness, of embracing all? Um, also, don't know. But it's important. I think it's very important. Um, recently, I, I saw this email from uh, come through my inbox from Jack, um, entitled "The Bodhisattva Responds to the Virus." And uh, there was one line in particular that struck me. I wanted to share it with you. He said, this is a time of mystery and uncertainty. Take a breath. <sighs> the veils of separation are parting and the reality of interconnection is apparent to everyone on earth. We've needed this pause, perhaps even needed our isolation to see how much we need one another. Um, so I, I wanted to share this because I feel like this is kind of at the heart uh, for me of what it means to respond with loving awareness. Um, like the actual real life situations that arise where we have to do something about them. And we get up off of our cushion where we've been cultivating these different states of consciousness and capacities. And we have to put them into action. We have to actually see, like, well, how do I respond to the situation, to this particular situation of being in isolation, 
Um, to how do I respond to the uncertainty that's coming with all of this, financial uncertainty perhaps, um, the uncertainty around how this will play out, where it will lead, when will we see our friends and loved ones up close again? You know, like all of these things are, I think, up and, and are big questions. This is a time of mystery and uncertainty, as Jack said. Um, and, and that can feel, on the one hand, like scary and you know, overwhelming. And I think all of us have probably felt some amount of that. And then on the other hand, it can feel like a huge opportunity, um, especially for a contemplative, from a contemplative perspective. Uh, and, and one thing I've heard since this, um, really in the last few weeks, since, since, since this pandemic started to kind of ramp up in intensity from the practitioners that I've con- been in contact with is a huge amount of gratitude from people for their practice. And I suspect you all probably feel that as well. Um, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, thank goodness I have developed this, you know, these skills and capacity to be present that in the midst of uncertainty that I've actually trained to be able to see that it is uncertain already. It's always been uncertain. You know, uh, the only certainty comes from our, our fixed ideas about how things are and our agreement with each other that this is true. Um, that's where the certainty comes from. It's a, it's a mental certainty, but it's not real. You know, this is, this, if this shows us anything, it's that we can't, can't rely on our conceptions of how things are going to play out. Um, and, you know, Buddhist practitioners have known this for a long time, but of course, knowing it conceptually and getting it at the deepest levels, this is the work. So this is the work of responding with loving awareness. Or as uh, Srini Sagradatta Maharaj put it, um, he says, wisdom, the wisdom function tells me that I'm nothing. And so, so that's a lot of what we train in wisdom, you know, seeing that we're nothing, no one, no, not, not what we thought we were. Love, he says, tells me that I'm everything. Between these two, my life flows. Between these two, wisdom and love. And uh, that's another, that's another way of translating loving awareness, wisdom and love. Or as the Mahayana Buddhists do, compassion and wisdom. There are these two dimensions, these two qualities, which are so important to come together in practice. One without the other leaves us bereft of something really important. For me, uh, the open heart has always been the challenge of opening to that, you know, of being with that, of um, not having this sort of wisdom faculty dominate. You know, so it's like seeing everything, seeing through everything, um, seeing the ephemerality of everything, not holding on to anything. That's great, but it can go, it can be too much, you know, without this sort of, the embracing quality, you know, the uh, inclusion of the open heart, um, it can become dissociative to be identified with awareness. You can lose your sense of personalhood, personness, in a way that's not particularly good <laughs> in my experience. And um, although that's part of the spiritual journey, you know, to empty the self, it's also part of the journey in my experience to pick the, to pick the, the self back up, you know, to... Um, to, to become reacquainted with this personality that continues no matter how much we've let go of identification with any aspect of it. 